The Greek military junta of 1967–1974, commonly known as the Regime of the Colonels Greek, Kathistos Tun Syntogmaterchen Kathistos Tun Syntogmaterchen Ka Theta Stos Tun Syn Da Dot Matar Xon, or in Greece simply the junta or, Greek, Chaunta translate. Chaunta Zunda, the dictatorship Eta Dictatoria, I Dictatoria and the Seven Years Eta Eptitia, I Eptitia, was a series of far-right military juntas that ruled Greece following the 1967 Greek coup d'état led by a group of colonels on 21 April 1967. The dictatorship ended on 24 July 1974 under the pressure of the Turkish invasion of Cyprus. The fall of the junta was followed by the Metapolitan FC, and the establishment of the current Third Hellenic Republic. <inaudible> Background The 1967 coup and the following seven years of military rule were the culmination of 30 years of national division between the forces of the left and the right, that can be traced to the time of the resistance against Axis occupation of Greece during World War II. After the liberation in 1944, Greece descended into a civil war, fought between the communist forces and the now-returned government in exile. American influence in Greece In 1944 British Prime Minister Winston Churchill determined to halt the Soviet encroachment in the Balkans, and ordered British forces to intervene in the Greek civil war in the wake of the retreating German military. This was to be a lengthy and open-ended commitment. The United States stepped in to help. In 1947, the United States formulated the Truman Doctrine, and began actively to support a series of authoritarian governments in Greece, Turkey, and Iran in order to ensure that these states did not fall under Soviet influence. With American and British aid, the civil war ended with the military defeat of the communists in 1949. The Communist Party of Greece KKE and its ancillary organizations were outlawed law 509 and many communists either fled the country or faced persecution. The Central Intelligence Agency CIA and the Greek military began to work closely, especially after Greece joined the North Atlantic Treaty Organization NATO in 1952. This included notable CIA officers Gust Avrakotos and Claire George. Avrakotos maintained a close relationship with the colonels who would figure in the later coup. Greece was a vital link in the NATO defense arc, which extended from the eastern border of Iran to the northernmost point in Norway. Greece, in particular, was seen as being at risk, having experienced a communist insurgency. In particular, the newly founded Hellenic National Intelligence Service (EYP) and the mountain raiding companies (LOK) maintained a very close liaison with their American counterparts. In addition to preparing for a Soviet invasion, they agreed to guard against a left-wing coup. The LOC in particular were integrated into the European stay-behind network. Although there have been persistent rumors about an active support of the coup by the U.S. government, there is no evidence to support such claims. The timing of the coup apparently caught the CIA by surprise. <laughs> Apostasia and political instability After many years of conservative rule, the election of the Center Union's Georgios Papandreou Sr. as Prime Minister was a sign of change. In a bid to gain more control over the country's government than his limited constitutional powers allowed, the young and inexperienced King Constantine II clashed with liberal reformers, dismissing Papandreou in 1965 and causing a constitutional crisis known as the Apostasia of 1965. After making several attempts to form governments, relying on dissident center union and conservative MPs, Constantine II appointed an interim government under Ioannis Periskovopoulos, and new elections were called for 28 May 1967. There were many indications that Papandreou's center union would emerge as the largest party, but would not be able to form a single party government and would be forced into an alliance with the United Democratic Left, which was suspected by conservatives of being a proxy for the banned KKE. This possibility was used as a pretext for the coup. Topic A: Generals Coup. Greek historiography and journalists have hypothesized about a generals coup 
A coup that would have been deployed at Constantine's behest under the pretext of combating communist subversion, before the elections that were scheduled for 28 May 1967, with expectations of a wide center union victory. A number of conservative national radical union politicians feared that the policies of left wing centrists, including Andreas Papandreou, the son of Georgios Papandreou Sr., would lead to a constitutional crisis. One such politician, George Rallis, proposed that, in case of such an anomaly. The king should declare martial law as the monarchist constitution permitted him. According to Rallis, Constantine was receptive to the idea. According to U.S. diplomat John Day, Washington also worried that Andreas Papandreou would have a very powerful role in the next government, because of his father's old age. According to Robert Keeley and John Owens, American diplomats present in Athens at the time, Constantine asked U.S. Ambassador William Phillips Talbot what the American attitude would be to an extra-parliamentary solution to the problem. To this the embassy responded negatively in principle, adding, however, that U.S. reaction to such move cannot be determined in advance but would depend on circumstances at the time. Constantine denies this. According to Talbot, Constantine met the army generals, who promised him that they would not take any action before the coming elections. However, the proclamations of Andreas Papandreou made them nervous, and they resolved to re examine their decision after seeing the results of the elections. In 1966, Constantine sent his envoy, Dimitrios Bitsios, to Paris on a mission to persuade former Prime Minister Constantine Karamanlis to return to Greece and resume his prior role in politics. According to uncorroborated claims made by the former monarch, Karamanlis replied to Bitsios that he would return only if the king imposed martial law, as was his constitutional prerogative. According to New York Times correspondent Cyrus L. Salzberger, Karamanlis flew to New York City to meet with USAF General Loris Norstad to lobby for a conservative coup that would establish himself as Greece's leader. Salzberger alleges that Norstad declined to involve himself in such affairs. Salzberger's account rests solely on the authority of his and Norstad's word. When, in 1997, the former king reiterated Salzberger's allegations, Karamanlis stated that he will not deal with the former king's statements because both their content and attitude are unworthy of comment. The deposed king's adoption of Salzberger's claims against Karamanlis was castigated by Greece's left-leaning media, which denounced Karamanlis as shameless and brazen. It bears noting that, at the time, Constantine referred exclusively to Salzberger's account to support the theory of a planned coup by Karamanlis, and made no mention of the alleged 1966 meeting with Bitsios, which he would refer to only after both participants had died and could not respond. As it turned out, the constitutional crisis did not originate either from the political parties, or from the palace, but from middle-rank army putschists. Coup d'état of the 21st of April. On the 21st of April 1967, just weeks before the scheduled elections, a group of right-wing army officers led by Brigadier General Stylianos Patakis and Colonels George Papadopoulos and Nikolaos Makarezos seized power in a coup d'état. The colonels were able to seize power quickly by using elements of surprise and confusion. Patakis was the commander of the Armor Training Center Greek, Kontro Ekpadiasis to Thorakismen and Keth based in Athens. The coup leaders placed tanks in strategic positions in Athens, effectively gaining complete control of the city. At the same time, a large number of small mobile units were dispatched to arrest leading politicians, authority figures, and ordinary citizens suspected of left-wing sympathies, according to lists prepared in advance. One of the first to be arrested was Lieutenant General Grigorios Spandidakis, commander-in-chief of the Greek army. The colonels persuaded Spandidakis to join them, having him activate a previously drafted action plan to move the coup forward. Under the command of paratrooper Lieutenant Colonel Kostas Aslanides, the Loke took over the Greek defense ministry while Patakis gained control of communication centers, the parliament, the royal palace, and, according to detailed lists, arrested over 10,000 people. By the early morning hours, the whole of Greece was in the hands of the colonels. All leading politicians, including acting Prime Minister Panagiotis Kanalopoulos, had been arrested and were held incommunicado by the conspirators. At 6 a.m., EET, Papadopoulos announced that 11 articles of the Greek constitution were suspended. One of the consequences of these suspensions was that anyone could be arrested without warrant at any time and brought before a military court to be tried. 
Ioannis Ladas, then the director of ESA, recounted in a later interview that, "...within 20 minutes every politician, every man, every anarchist who was listed could be rounded up. It was a simple, diabolical plan." Georgios Papandreou was arrested after a nighttime raid at his villa in Castri, Attica. Andreas was arrested at around the same time, after seven soldiers armed with fixed bayonets and a machine gun forcibly entered his home. Andreas Papandreou escaped to the roof of his house, but surrendered after one of the soldiers held a gun to the head of his then 14-year-old son George Papandreou. Gust Avrakotos, a high-ranking CIA officer in Greece who was close with the colonels, advised them to shoot the motherfucker because he's going to come back to haunt you. U.S. critics of the coup included then-Senator Lee Metcalf, who criticized the Johnson administration for providing aid to a military regime of collaborators and Nazi sympathizers. Phillips Talbot, the U.S. ambassador in Athens, disapproved of the coup, complaining that it represented a rape of democracy, to which John M. Morey, the CIA station chief in Athens, answered, How can you rape a whore? Papadopoulos Junta attempted to re-engineer the Greek political landscape by coup. Papadopoulos as well as the other Junta members are known in Greece by the term Aprilinoi, Aprilians, denoting the month of the coup. The term Aprilinoi has become synonymous with the term Dictators of 1974. <laughs> Topic. Role of the king When the tanks came to the streets of Athens on 21 April, the legitimate National Radical Union government, of which Rallis was a member, asked King Constantine to immediately mobilize the state against the coup, he declined to do so, and swore in the dictators as the legitimate government of Greece. The three plot leaders visited Constantine in his residence in Tatoi, which they circled with tanks, effectively preventing any form of resistance. The king wrangled with the colonels and initially dismissed them, ordering them to return with Spandidakis. Later in the day he took it upon himself to go to the Ministry of National Defense, located north of Athens city center, where all the coup leaders were gathered. The king had a discussion with Canalopolis, who was detained there, and with leading generals. This was a pointless exercise, since Canalopolis was a prisoner whilst the generals had no real power, as was evident from the shouting of lower and middle ranking officers, refusing to obey orders and clamoring for a new government under Spandidakis. The king finally relented and decided to cooperate, claiming to this day that he was isolated and did not know what else to do. He has since claimed that he was trying to gain time to organize a counter coup and oust the junta. He did organize such a counter coup, however, the fact that the new government had a legal sanction, in that it had been appointed by the legitimate head of state, played an important role in the coup's success. The king was later to regret his decision bitterly. For many Greeks, it served to identify him indelibly with the coup and certainly played an important role in the final decision to abolish the monarchy, sanctioned by the 1974 referendum. The only concession the king could achieve was to appoint a civilian as prime minister, rather than Spandidakis. Constantinos Kolias, a former attorney general of the Arios Pagos Supreme Court, was chosen. He was a well-known royalist and had even been disciplined under the Papandreou government for meddling in the investigation on the murder of MP Gregoris Lambracus. Kolias was little more than a figurehead and real power rested with the army, and especially Papadopoulos, who emerged as the coup's strong man and became minister to the presidency of the government. Other coup members occupied key posts. Up until then constitutional legitimacy had been preserved, since under the Greek constitution the king could appoint whomever he wanted as prime minister, as long as parliament endorsed the appointment with a vote of confidence or a general election was called. It was this government, sworn in during the early evening hours of 21 April, that formalized the coup. It adopted a constituent act, an amendment tantamount to a revolution, cancelling the elections and effectively abolishing the constitution, which would be replaced later. In the meantime, the government was to rule by decree. Since traditionally such constituent acts did not need to be signed by the crown, the king never signed it, permitting him to claim, years later, that he had never signed any document instituting the junta. Critics claim that Constantine II did nothing to prevent the government and especially his chosen prime minister, Coleus, from legally instituting the authoritarian government to come. This same government published and enforced a decree, already proclaimed on radio as the coup was in progress, instituting military law. 
Constantine claimed he never signed that decree either. Topic: <laughs> King's counter coup. From the outset, the relationship between Constantine and the colonels was an uneasy one. The colonels were not willing to share power, whereas the young king, like his father before him, was used to playing an active role in politics and would never consent to being a mere figurehead, especially in a military administration. Although the colonel's strong anti-communist, pro-NATO, and pro-Western views appealed to the United States, President Lyndon B. Johnson, in an attempt to avoid an international backlash, told Constantine that it would be best to replace the junta with a new government according to Paul Ioannidis in his book Destiny Prevails, My Life with Aristoteles Onassis. Constantine took that as an encouragement to organize a counter-coup, although no direct help or involvement of the U.S. or Britain was forthcoming. The king finally decided to launch his counter-coup on 13 December 1967. Since Athens was militarily in the hands of the colonels, Constantine decided to fly to the small northern city of Kavala, where he hoped to be among troops loyal only to him. The vague plan that Constantine and his advisors had conceived was to form a unit that would invade and take control over Thessaloniki, where an alternative administration would be installed. Constantine hoped that international recognition and internal pressure between the two governments would force the junta to resign, leaving the field clear for him to return triumphant to Athens. In the early morning hours of 13 December, the king boarded the royal plane, together with Queen Anne Marie, their two baby children Princess Alexia and Crown Prince Pavlos, his mother Frederica, and his sister, Princess Irene. Constantine also took with him Prime Minister Colias. At first, things seemed to be going according to plan. Constantine was well received in Kavala, which was under the command of a general loyal to him. The Hellenic Air Force and Navy, both strongly royalist and not involved in the junta, immediately declared for him and mobilized. Another of Constantine's generals effectively cut all communication between Athens and northern Greece. However, Constantine's plans were overly bureaucratic, naively supposing that orders from a commanding general would automatically be obeyed. Further, Constantine was obsessive about avoiding bloodshed, even where the junta would most likely respond with violence. Instead of attempting to drum up the widest popular support, hoping for spontaneous pro-democracy risings in most towns, Constantine preferred to let his generals put together the necessary force for advancing on Thessaloniki in strict compliance with military bureaucracy. The king made no attempt to contact politicians, even local ones, and even took care to include in his proclamation a paragraph condemning communism, lest anyone would get the wrong idea. In the circumstances, middle-ranking pro-junta officers neutralized and arrested Constantine's royalist generals and took command of their units, and subsequently put together a force to advance on Kavala to arrest the king. The junta, not at all shaken by the loss of their figurehead premier, ridiculed Constantine by announcing that he was hiding from village to village. Realizing that the counter-coup had failed, Constantine fled Greece on board the royal plane, taking his family and the helpless Colias with him. They landed in Rome early in the morning of 14 December. Constantine remained in exile all through the rest of military rule. Even though he would return to Greece, the country's abolition of the monarchy in 1973 stripped him of his status as king. Regency. The flight of Constantine and Colias left Greece with no legal government or head of state. This did not concern the military junta. Instead the Revolutionary Council, composed of Patakis, Papadopoulos, and Makarezos, appointed another member to the military administration, Major General Georgios Zoitakis, as regent. Zoitakis then appointed Papadopoulos as prime minister. This became the only government of Greece following the failure of the king's attempted counter-coup, as Constantine was unwilling to set up an alternative administration in exile. In hopes of giving legal sanction to the regime, the junta drafted a new constitution. It made the military the guardians of social and political order, with wide autonomy from governmental and parliamentary oversight. It also heavily circumscribed the activities of political parties. The new constitution was approved in a 15 November referendum, with over 92% approval. However, the referendum was conducted in less than free circumstances. The regime deployed extensive propaganda in favor of the new document while muzzling any opposition. 
Under the new constitution, the regency would continue until elections were held, unless the junta called Constantine back sooner though Constantine never acknowledged, let alone recognized, the regency. However, the junta announced that the "'Revolution of April 21st, as the regime called itself would need time to reform the "'Greek mentality' before holding elections. It also suspended most of the constitution's guarantees of civil rights until the restoration of civilian rule. In a legally controversial move, even under the junta's own constitution, the cabinet voted on 21 March 1972 to oust Zoitakis and replace him with Papadopoulos, thus combining the offices of regent and prime minister. It was thought Zoitakis was problematic and interfered too much with the military. The king's portrait remained on coins, in public buildings, etc., but slowly, the military chipped away at the institution of the monarchy, the royal family's tax immunity was abolished, the complex network of royal charities was brought under direct state control, the royal arms were removed from coins, the navy and air force dropped their royal names, and newspapers were prohibited from publishing the king's photo or any interviews. During this period, resistance against the colonel's rule became better organized among exiles in Europe and the United States. In addition to the expected opposition from the left, the colonels found themselves under attack by constituencies that had traditionally supported past right-wing regimes, pro-monarchists supporting Constantine, businessmen concerned about international isolation, and a middle class facing an economic downturn after 1971. There was also considerable political infighting within the junta. Still, up until 1973, the junta appeared in firm control of Greece, and not likely to be ousted by violent means. Characteristics of the junta Ideology The colonels preferred to call the coup a revolution to save the nation. Ethnosoterios epanastasis. Their official justification was that a communist conspiracy had infiltrated Greece's bureaucracy, academia, press, and military, to such an extent that drastic action was needed to protect the country from communist takeover. Thus, the defining characteristic of the junta was its staunch anti communism. They used the term anarcho communist to describe leftists in general. In a similar vein, the junta attempted to steer Greek public opinion not only by propaganda but also by inventing new words and slogans, such as old partyism to discredit parliamentary democracy, or Greece for Christian Greeks to underscore its ideology. The junta's main ideological spokesmen included Georgios Georgilas and journalist Savas Konstantopoulos, both former Marxists. Patient in a cast, and other metaphors. Throughout his tenure as the junta strongman, Papadopoulos often employed what have been described by the BBC as gory medical metaphors, where he or the junta assumed the role of the medical doctor. The supposed patient was Greece. Typically, Papadopoulos or the junta portrayed themselves as the doctor who operated on the patient by putting the patient's foot in an orthopedic cast and applying restraints on the patient, tying him on a surgical bed and putting him under anesthesia to perform the operation, so that the life of the patient would not be endangered during the operation. In one of his famous speeches Papadopoulos mentioned, Euriskamatha pro enos asthenis ton opoian aishoman epa cherorgikes kleins kai ton opoian ian omicron cherorgos den prostes kata ten diarchian tes encherisios kai tes narcosios epa tes cherorgikes kleins Eparche pithonotes anti dia tes encherisios na tu cherise ten apokatastasin tes ygias na tun odigise ice thanaton oi perioris moi eni e eta prostesis tu asthenis epa kleins dia na e post akandinos ten encherisin. Translating as We are in front of a patient who we have on a surgical bed, and who, should the surgeon not strap on the surgical bed during the operation and the anesthesia, there is a probability, rather than the surgery granting him the restoration of the health, to lead him to his death. The restrictions are the strapping of the patient to the surgical bed so that he will undergo the surgery without danger. In the same speech Papadopoulos continued, Asthenium and ice ton gypsum ton 
Tun dokumazaman ian emperae na perpatai choris tun gypsum. Spasimon tun archikon gypsum kai zanabasimon endekomenos tun kinorgio ek opo kryazitai to demopsifisma de inii mia genike theoresis tun ekonoton tu asthenis. As prosiuchithamon na mi kryazitai zana gypsum. Ian kryazitai de tu tun belomen. Kai to monon pu imporo na sas epashedo inii na sas kalezo na idet kai cease to pati choris gypsum, which translates as follows We have a patient. We have put him in a plaster cast. We are checking him to find out if he can walk without the plaster cast. We break the initial cast, potentially to replace it with a new one, where necessary. The referendum shall become a general overview of the patient's capabilities. Let us pray for him never to need a cast again, and should he need one, we will put it to him. And the one thing I can promise you, is to invite you to witness the foot without a cast. Other metaphors contained religious imagery related to the resurrection of Christ at Easter. Christos anst elis anst. Christ has risen, Greece has risen. Alluding that the junta would save Greece and resurrect her into a greater, new land. The theme of rebirth was used many times as a standard reply to avoid answering any questions as to how long the dictatorship would last. Diati auto ta telutai an inii ipothesis on inii ipothesis e kanan oi o poioi ethesen ten thrialita ice ten dynamita de dia ten ekrexen pros anagenesen tes politias ten nykta tes twenty one aprilu. Translating as Because the latter is someone else's concern. They are the concerns of those, who lit the fuse of the dynamite for the explosion which led to the rebirth of the state the night of 21 April 1967. The religious themes and rebirth metaphors are also seen in the following I epochrosis mas paragraphantai chi apo ten threskian chi apo ten istorian mas omenoian chi agapen didisque omicron Christos, piston ice ten patrita epitasse eta istoria mas Eta elas anagenitai, eta elas de megalorgesi, eta elas panta de ze. Translated as Our obligations are described by both our religion and our history. Christ teaches concord and love. Our history demands faith in the fatherland. Hellas is being reborn, Hellas will accomplish great things, Hellas will live forever. Topic. Civil rights As soon as the coup d'état was announced over Greek radio, martial music was continuously broadcast over the airwaves. This was interrupted from time to time with announcements of the junta issuing orders, which always started with the introduction, We decide and we order. Greek. Apophysizomen kaidetizomen. Long standing political freedoms and civil liberties, that had been taken for granted and enjoyed by the Greek people for decades, were instantly suppressed. Article 14 of the Greek Constitution, which protected freedom of thought and freedom of the press, was immediately suspended. Military courts were established, and political parties were dissolved. Legislation that took decades to fine-tune and multiple parliaments to enact was thus erased in a matter of days. The rapid dismantling of Greek democracy had begun. In fact, the junta crackdown was so fast that by September 1967, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and the Netherlands went before the European Commission of Human Rights to accuse Greece of violating most of the human rights protected by the European Convention on Human Rights. Following the coup, 6,188 suspected communists and political opponents were imprisoned or exiled to remote Greek islands. Under the junta, torture became a deliberate practice carried out both by the security police and the Greek military police (ESA), with an estimated 3,500 people detained in torture centers run by ESA. Commonly used methods of torture included, but were not limited to, beating the soles of detainees' feet, sexual torture, choking, and ripping out body hair. The Special Interrogation Unit of the Greek Military Police ET, ESA, used a combination of techniques that included continuous standing in an empty room, sleep and food deprivation, beatings and loud sounds, according to recent research based on new interviews with survivors, in the period from May to November 1973 this combination of interrogation techniques also included the repetition of songs that were popular hits of the time. These were played loudly and repeatedly from loudspeakers. These methods attacked the senses without leaving any visible traces and have been classified since as torture by international organizations. According to a human rights report by Amnesty International, in the first month of the 21st of April coup an estimated 8,000 people were arrested. 
James Beckett, an American attorney and author of Barbarism in Greece, was sent to Greece by Amnesty International and wrote in December 1969 that, "...a conservative estimate would place at not less than 2,000." The number of people tortured, the citizens' right of assembly was revoked and no political demonstrations were allowed. Surveillance on citizens was a fact of life, even during permitted social activities. That had a continuously chilling effect on the population who realized that, even though they were allowed certain social activities, they could not overstep the boundaries and delve into or discuss forbidden subjects. This realization, including the absence of any civil rights as well as maltreatment during police arrest, ranging from threats to beatings or worse, made life under the junta a difficult proposition for many ordinary citizens. Photography by ordinary citizens was banned in public locations. The junta allowed citizens to participate in ordinary societal events that reflected those of the United States and United Kingdom, such as rock concerts for example. However, citizens lived in extreme fear, as any behavior that the junta disapproved of, coupled with the complete absence of any civil rights or freedoms, could easily result in torture, beatings, exile, imprisonment or worse, and the labeling of the victim as anarcho-communisti, anarcho-communists, or worse. The absence of a valid code of jurisprudence led to the unequal application of the law among the citizens and to rampant favoritism and nepotism. Absence of elected representation meant that the citizens' stark and only choice was to submit to these arbitrary measures exactly as dictated by the junta. The country had become a true police state. Complete lack of press freedom coupled with non existent civil rights meant that continuous cases of civil rights abuses could neither be reported nor investigated by an independent press or any other reputable authority. This led to a psychology of fear among the citizens during the Papadopoulos dictatorship, which became worse under Ioannidis. <laughs> External relations The military government was given support by the United States as a Cold War ally, due to its proximity to the Eastern European Soviet bloc, and the fact that the previous Truman administration had given the country millions of dollars in economic aid to discourage communism. U.S. support for the junta, which was staunchly anti-communist, is claimed to be the cause of rising anti-Americanism in Greece during and following the junta's undemocratic rule. Greece's allies in Western Europe were split in their attitudes toward the junta. The Scandinavian countries and the Netherlands took a very hostile stance towards the junta and filed a complaint before the Human Rights Commission of the Council of Europe in September 1967. Greece however opted to leave the Council of Europe voluntarily in December 1969 before a verdict was handed down. Countries such as the United Kingdom and the Federal Republic of Germany on the other hand were voicing criticism about Greece's human rights record but supported the country's continued membership in the Council of Europe and NATO because of the country's strategic value for the Western alliance. Sociocultural policies. To gain support for his rule, Papadopoulos projected an image that appealed to some key segments of Greek society. The son of a poor but educated rural family, he was educated at the prestigious Hellenic Military Academy. Papadopoulos allowed substantial social and cultural freedoms to all social classes, but political oppression and censorship were at times heavy-handed, especially in areas deemed sensitive by the junta, such as political activities, and politically related art, literature, film and music. Kostas Gavras's film Z and Mikas Theodorakis's music, among others, were never allowed even during the most relaxed times of the dictatorship, and an index of prohibited songs, literature and art was kept. <laughs> Western music and film Remarkably, after some initial hesitation and as long as they were not deemed to be politically damaging to the junta, junta censors allowed wide access to Western music and films. Even the then racy West German film Helga, German, Helga. Vom Worden des Menschlichen Lebens, Greek, Helga, Eta Historia Mias Gynaikas, a 1967 sex education documentary featuring a live birth scene, had no trouble making its debut in Greece just like in any other Western country. Moreover, the film was only restricted for those under 13 years of age. In 1971 Robert Hartford Davis was allowed by the junta to film the classic horror film Incense for the Damned, starring Peter Cushing and Patrick McNee and suitably featuring Chris's, Chris's a beguiling Greek siren with vampire tendencies, on the Greek island of Hydra. 
In 1970 the film Woodstock was shown all over Greece, with reports of arrests and disturbances especially in Athens as many youths flocked to see the film and filled theatres to capacity, while many others were left outside. Films such as Marijuana Stop, dealt with the hippie culture and its perception in Greek society as drug using. Meanwhile, at Matala, Crete, a hippie colony which had been living in the caves since the 1960s, was never disturbed. Singer-songwriter Joni Mitchell was inspired to write the song, Carry, after staying in the Matala Caves with the hippie community in 1971. Hippie colonies also existed in other popular tourist spots such as Paradise Beach in Mykonos. Topic. Greek rock In the early days of the dictatorship, Western music broadcasts were limited from the airwaves in favor of martial music, but this was eventually relaxed. In addition, pop, rock music programs such as the one hosted by famous Greek music, radio, television personality and promoter Nico Mastrakis were very popular throughout the dictatorship years both on radio and television. Most Western record sales were similarly not restricted. In fact, even rock concerts and tours were allowed such as by the then popular rock groups Socrates Drank the Conium and Nostradamos, another pop group. Pole was a pioneer of Greek pop music in the early 1970s. Its lead singer and composer was Robert Williams, who was later joined, in 1971, by Costas Tornas. Pole enjoyed a number of nationwide hits, such as Anthropagapa, Mankind Love One Another. An anti-war song, composed by Tornas and Ella Illy Mo, Come, My Son, composed by Tornas, Williams. Tornas later pursued a solo career and in 1972 produced the progressive psychedelic hit solo album Apparenta Chorafia Greek, Apparenta Chorafia Infinite Fields. He wrote and arranged the album using an orchestra and a rock group, Ruth, combination. In 1973 Costas Tornas created the album Astronera Star Dreams, influenced by David Bowie's Ziggy Stardust. Songwriter Dionysus Savapoulos, who was initially imprisoned by the regime, nevertheless rose to great popularity and produced a number of influential and highly politically allegorical, especially against the junta, albums during the period, including To Paravoli Tou Trelu Greek, To Paravoli Tou Trelu The Madman's Orchard, Balos Greek, Malo's Name of Greek Folk Dance and Romiko Somi Greek, Bromiko Somi Dirty Bread. Topic. Tourism. Concurrently, tourism was actively encouraged by Papadopoulos government and, funding scandals notwithstanding, there was great development of the tourist sector. With tourism came nightlife. However, under Papadopoulos, in the absence of any civil rights these socio-cultural freedoms existed in a legal vacuum that meant they were not guaranteed, but rather dispensed at the whim of the junta. In addition any transgressing into political matters during social or cultural activities usually meant arrest and punishment. Tourism was furthered by the 1969 European Championships in Athletics in Athens which showed political normality. Even the boycott of the West German team was not directed against the junta, but against its own team leadership. Although discos and nightclubs were, initially, subjected to a curfew, partially due to an energy crisis, this was eventually extended from 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. as the energy crisis eased. These freedoms were later reversed by Dimitrios Ioannidis after his coup. Topic. Agriculture The farmers were Papadopoulos' natural constituency and were more likely to support him, seeing him, because of his rural roots, as one of their own. He cultivated this relationship by appealing to them, calling them, the backbone of the people, Greek, Ada Rachakakalia tu Lao, and cancelling all agricultural loans. By further insisting on promoting, but not really enforcing for fear of middle-class backlash, religion and patriotism, he further appealed to the simpler ideals of rural Greece and strengthened his image as people's champion among farmers, who tended to ridicule the middle class. Furthermore, the regime promoted a policy of economic development in rural areas, which were mostly neglected by the previous governments, that had focused largely on urban industrial development. Topic. Urban classes. Papadopoulos was less likely to appeal to the largely civilian and city-oriented middle class, since he was a military man from a rural background. 
In addition, he had promised from the beginning that the dictatorship would not be permanent, and that when political order was established democratic rule would return. On top of that, his promotion of tourism and other beneficial economic measures and the fact that, with the notable exceptions of political freedoms and press censorship, he did not otherwise substantially restrict the middle class, had the effect of assisting the junta in establishing its control over the country by gaining, at least initially, the reluctant acquiescence of some key segments of the population. Economic policies The 1967–1973 period was marked by high rates of economic growth coupled with low inflation and low unemployment. Economic growth was driven by investment in the tourism industry, loose emigration policies, public spending, and pro-business incentives that fostered both domestic and foreign capital spending. Several international companies invested in Greece at the time, including the Coca-Cola Company. Economic growth started losing steam by 1972. In addition, large-scale construction of hydroelectric dam projects, such as in Alekman, Castraction, Polyphytos, the expansion of thermoelectric generation units and other significant infrastructure development, took place. The junta used to proudly announce these projects with the slogan, Greece is a construction zone. Ada Ella's Enii Ana Ergataxian, the always smiling Stylianos Patakis, also known as the first trowel of Greece, to Proto Maestri Tes Eladas, since he frequently appeared at project inaugurations with a trowel in hand, starred in many of the Epikyra propaganda documentaries that were screened before feature film presentation in Greek cinemas. Financial <inaudible> <inaudible> scandals <inaudible> 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 Cases of non-transparent public deals and corruption allegedly occurred at the time, given the lack of democratic checks and balances and the absence of a free press. One such event is associated with the regime's tourism minister, Ioannis Ladas, Greek. Ioannis Ladas. During his administration, several low-interest loans, amortized over a 20-year period, were issued for tourist development. This fostered the erection of a multitude of hotels, sometimes in non-tourist areas, and with no underlying business rationale. Several such hotels were abandoned unfinished as soon as the loans were secured, and their remains still dot the Greek countryside. These questionable loans are referred to as thalassidanea Greek, thalassidanea or loans of the sea. To indicate the loose terms under which they were granted, another contested policy of the regime was the writing off of agricultural loans, up to a value of 100,000 drachmas, to farmers. This has been attributed to an attempt by Papadopoulos to gain public support for his regime. <laughs> Italian connection At the time, the Italian far right was very impressed with the methods of Papadopoulos and his junta. In April 1968 Papadopoulos invited 50 Italian members of the far right including Stefano della Chiai on a Greek tour with the purpose of demonstrating to the Italians the methods of the junta. Other invitees included members of Ordin Nuovo, Avangardia Nazionale, Europa Civilta and Fuan La Caravella, C.F. Frattini, Entity, 2004, p. 304. The Italians were sufficiently impressed that upon return to their country, the operatives of the Italian far-right escalated the political violence in their country to a new level embarking on a terror campaign of bombings and other violence which killed and injured hundreds. Afterwards, the right-wing instigators of this violence blamed the communists. After their visit to Greece, the Italian neo-fascists also engaged in false flag operations and embarked on a campaign of infiltration of leftist, anarchist and Marxist-Leninist organizations. One of the neo-fascists conducted frequent provocations and infiltration in the months leading to the Piazza Fontana bombing on 12 December 1969. The Greek junta was so impressed with the manner their Italian counterparts were paving the way toward an Italian coup d'état that on 15 May 1969 Papadopoulos sent them a congratulatory message stating that his Excellency the Prime Minister notes that the efforts that have been undertaken by the Greek national government in Italy for some time start to have some impact. <inaudible> Anti-junta movement The democratic elements of the Greek society were opposed to the junta from the start. In 1968 many militant groups promoting democratic rule were formed, both in exile and in Greece. 
These included, among others, Panhellenic Liberation Movement, Democratic Defense, the Socialist Democratic Union, as well as groups from the entire left wing of the Greek political spectrum, including the Communist Party of Greece which had been outlawed even before the junta. The first armed action against the junta was the failed assassination attempt against George Papadopoulos by Alexandros Panagoulis, on 13 August 1968. Assassination attempt by Panagoulis The assassination attempt took place on the morning of 13 August, when Papadopoulos went from his summer residence in Laganisi to Athens, escorted by his personal security motorcycles and cars. Alexandros Panagoulis ignited a bomb at a point of the coastal road where the limousine carrying Papadopoulos would have to slow down, but the bomb failed to harm Papadopoulos. Panagoulis was captured a few hours later in a nearby sea cave, as the boat that would let him escape the scene of the attack had not shown up. Panagoulis was transferred to the Greek Military Police offices, where he was questioned, beaten and tortured see the proceedings of Theophilo Yiannikos trial. On 17 November 1968 he was sentenced to death, and remained in prison for five years. After the restoration of democracy, Panagoulis was elected a member of parliament. Panagoulis is regarded as an emblematic figure for the struggle to restore democracy. Topic: <inaudible> Broadening of the movement. The funeral of George Papandreou Sr. on the 3rd of November 1968 spontaneously turned into a massive demonstration against the junta. Thousands of Athenians disobeyed the military's orders and followed the casket to the cemetery. The government reacted by arresting 41 people. On 28 March 1969, after two years of widespread censorship, political detentions and torture, Georgos Seferis, recipient of the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1963, took a stand against the junta. He made a statement on the BBC World Service, with copies simultaneously distributed to every newspaper in Athens. Attacking the colonels, he passionately demanded that, "...this anomaly must end." Seferis did not live to see the end of the junta. His funeral, though, on 20 September 1972, turned into a massive demonstration against the military government. Also in 1969, Costa Gavras released the film Z, based on a book by celebrated left-wing writer Vasilis Vasilikos. The film, banned in Greece, presented a lightly fictionalized account of the events surrounding the assassination of United Democratic Left MP Gregoris Lambrakis in 1963. The film captured the sense of outrage about the junta. The soundtrack of the film was written by Mikis Theodoricus, who was imprisoned by the junta and later went into exile, and the music was smuggled into the country to be added to the other inspirational, underground Theodoricus tracks. A lesser-known Danish film, in Greek, Your Neighbor's Son, detailed the subordination and training of simple youths to become torturers for the junta. Topic. International protest. The junta exiled thousands on the grounds that they were communists and or enemies of the country. Most of them were subjected to internal exile on Greek deserted islands, such as Makronisos, Garos, Jora, or inhabited islands such as Leros, Agios Eustratios or Trikeri. The most famous were in external exile, most of whom were substantially involved in the resistance, organizing protests in European capital cities, or helping and hiding refugees from Greece. These included, Melina Mercouri, actor, singer and, after 1981 Minister for Culture, Mikis Theodoricus, composer of resistance songs, Kostas Simitis, Prime Minister from 1996 to 2004, Andreas Papandreou, Prime Minister from 1981 to 1989 and again from 1993 to 1996, and Lady Amalia Fleming, wife of Sir Alexander Fleming, philanthropist, political activist. Some chose exile, unable to stand life under the junta. For example, Melina Mercouri was allowed to enter Greece, but stayed away on her own accord. In the early hours of 19 September 1970 in Matteotti Square in Genoa, geology student Kostas Georgiakis set himself ablaze in protest against the dictatorship of George Papadopoulos. The junta delayed the arrival of his remains to Corfu for four months, fearing public reaction and protests. At the time his death caused a sensation in Greece and abroad as it was the first tangible manifestation of the depth of resistance against the junta. 
He is the only known anti-junta resistance activist to have sacrificed himself and he is considered the precursor of later student protest, such as the Athens Polytechnic Uprising. The municipality of Corfu has dedicated a memorial in his honor near his home in Corfu City. The German writer, investigative reporter and journalist Gunder Walraff traveled to Greece in May 1974. While in Syntagma Square, he protested against human right violations. He was arrested and tortured by the police, as he did not carry, on purpose, any papers on him that could identify him as a foreigner. After his identity was revealed, Walraff was convicted and sentenced to 14 months in jail. He was released in August, after the end of the dictatorship. Topic. Velo's mutiny In an anti-junta protest, on 23 May 1973, HNS Velos, under the command of Commander Nikolaos Pappas, refused to return to Greece after participating in a NATO exercise and remained anchored at Fiumicino, Italy. During a patrol with other NATO vessels between continental Italy and Sardinia, the commander and the officers heard over the radio that a number of fellow naval officers had been arrested in Greece. Commander Pappas was involved in a group of democratic officers who remained loyal to their oath to obey the constitution and planned to act against the junta. Evangelos Averoff also participated in the Velos mutiny, for which he was later arrested as an instigator. Pappas believed that since his fellow anti-junta officers had been arrested, there was no more hope for a movement inside Greece. He therefore decided to act alone in order to motivate global public opinion. He mustered all the crew to the stern and announced his decision, which was received with enthusiasm by the crew. Pappas signaled his intentions to the squadron commander and NATO headquarters, quoting the preamble of the North Atlantic Treaty, which declares that all governments are determined to safeguard the freedom, common heritage and civilization of their peoples, founded on the principles of democracy, individual liberty and the rule of law." And, leaving formation, sailed for Rome. There, anchored about 3.5 nautical miles 6 kilometers away from the coast of Fiumicino, three ensigns sailed ashore with a whaleboat, went to Fiumicino Airport and telephoned the international press agencies, notifying them of the situation in Greece, the presence of the destroyer, and that the captain would hold a press conference the next day. This action increased international interest in the situation in Greece. The commander, six officers, and 25 petty officers requested permission to remain abroad as political refugees. Indeed, the whole crew wished to follow their commander but were advised by its officers to remain on board and return to Greece to inform families and friends about what happened. Velos returned to Greece after a month with a replacement crew. After the fall of the junta all officers and petty officers returned to the navy. Topic. Collapse The collapse of the junta both ideologically and politically was triggered by a series of events which unfolded soon after Papadopoulos' attempt at liberalization, with ideological collapse preceding its eventual political collapse. During and following this ill-fated process the internal political strains of the junta came to the fore and pitted the junta factions against each other, thus destroying the seemingly monolithic cohesion of the dictatorship. This had the effect of seriously weakening the coherence of the political message and, consequently, the credibility of the regime, a fatal blow from which, as later events would show, it never recovered. At the same time, during Papadopoulos' attempt at liberalization, some of the junta constraints were removed from the body politic of Greece and that led to demands for more freedoms, and political unrest, in a society well used to democratic action prior to the dictatorship. Normalization and attempts at liberalization Papadopoulos had indicated as early as 1968 that he was eager for a reform process. He had declared at the time that he did not want the revolution, junta speak for the dictatorship, to become a regime. He then repeatedly attempted to initiate reforms in 1969 and 1970, only to be thwarted by the hardliners, including Ioannidis. In fact subsequent to his 1970 failed attempt at reform, he threatened to resign and was dissuaded only after the hardliners renewed their personal allegiance to him. On 10 April 1970 Papadopoulos announced the formation of the Symvuleftiki Epitropi Symbolutik Epitrope translated as the Advisory Council Committee otherwise known as Papadopoulos Pseudo Parliament. 
Composed of members elected through an electoral type process but limited only to ethnicophrons regime supporters, it was bicameral, composed of the Central Advisory Council and the Provincial Advisory Council. The Central Council met in Athens in the Parliament building. Both councils had the purpose to advise the dictator. At the time of the announcement of the formation of the council, Papadopoulos explained that he wanted to avoid using the term Vuli Parliament for the committee because it sounded bad. The council was dissolved just prior to Papadopoulos' failed attempt to liberalize his regime. As internal dissatisfaction grew in the early 1970s, and especially after an abortive coup by the Navy in early 1973, Papadopoulos attempted to legitimize the regime by beginning a gradual democratization. See also the article on Metapolitefsi. On 1 June 1973, he abolished the monarchy and declared Greece a republic with himself as president. He was confirmed in office after a controversial referendum, the results of which were not recognized by the political parties. He furthermore sought the support of the old political establishment, but secured only the cooperation of Spiros Markazinis, who became prime minister. Concurrently, many restrictions were lifted, and the army's role significantly reduced. Papadopoulos intended to establish a presidential republic, with extensive and within the context of the system, almost dictatorial powers vested in the office of president, which he held. The decision to return to political rule and the restriction of their role was resented by many of the regime's supporters in the army, whose dissatisfaction with Papadopoulos would become evident a few months later. Topic. Uprising at the Polytechnic Papadopoulos' heavy-handed attempt at liberalization did not find favor among many in Greece. The stilted democratization process he proposed was constrained by multiple factors. His inexperience at carrying out an unprecedented political experiment of democratization was burdened by his tendency to concentrate as much power in his hands as possible, a weakness he exhibited during the junta years when he would sometimes hold multiple high echelon government portfolios. This especially antagonized the intelligentsia, whose primary exponents were the students. The students at the law school in Athens, for example, demonstrated multiple times against the dictatorship prior to the events at the Polytechnion. The tradition of student protest was always strong in Greece, even before the dictatorship. Papadopoulos tried hard to suppress and discredit the student movement during his tenure at the helm of the junta. But the liberalization process he undertook allowed the students to organize more freely, and this gave the opportunity to the students at the National Technical University of Athens to organize a demonstration that grew progressively larger and more effective. The political momentum was on the side of the students. Sensing this, the junta panicked and reacted violently. In the early hours of Saturday, 17 November 1973, Papadopoulos sent the army to suppress the student strike and sit in of the free besieged. Eleutheroi Poliorkomenoi as the students called themselves, at the Athens Polytechnic which had commenced on 14 November. Shortly after 3 a.m. EET, under almost complete cover of darkness, an AMX-30 tank crashed through the rail gate of the Athens Polytechnic with subsequent loss of life. The army also occupied Syntagma Square for at least the following day. Even the sidewalk cafes were closed. Ioannidis' involvement in inciting unit commanders to commit criminal acts during the uprising, so that he could facilitate his own upcoming coup, was noted in the indictment presented to the court by the prosecutor during the Greek junta trials, and in his subsequent conviction in the Polytechnian trial where he was found to have been morally responsible for the events. Ioannidis' coup and regime The uprising triggered a series of events that put an abrupt end to Papadopoulos' attempts at liberalization. Brigadier Dimitrios Ioannidis, a disgruntled junta hardliner and longtime protege of Papadopoulos as head of the feared military police, used the uprising as a pretext to re-establish public order, and staged a counter-coup that overthrew Papadopoulos and Spiros Markazinis on 25 November. Military law was reinstated, and the new junta appointed General Faden Gazikis as president and economist Adamantios Androusopoulos as prime minister, although Ioannidis remained the behind-the-scenes strongman. Ioannidis's heavy-handed and opportunistic intervention had the effect of destroying the myth that the junta was an idealistic group of army officers with exactly the same ideals who came to save Greece by using their collective wisdom. The main tenet of the junta ideology and mythology was gone and so was the collective. 
By default, he remained the only man at the top after toppling the other three principals of the junta. Characteristically, he cited ideological reasons for ousting the Papadopoulos faction, accusing them with straying from the principles of the revolution, especially of being corrupt and misusing their privileges as army officers for financial gains. Papadopoulos and his junta always claimed that the 21 April 1967 revolution saved Greece from the old party system. Now Ioannidis was, in effect, claiming that his coup saved the revolution from the Papadopoulos faction. The dysfunction as well as the ideological fragmentation and fractionalization of the junta was finally out in the open. Ioannidis, however, did not make these accusations personally as he always tried to avoid unnecessary publicity. The radio broadcasts, following the now familiar coup in progress scenario featuring martial music interspersed with military orders and curfew announcements, kept repeating that the army was taking back the reins of power in order to save the principles of the revolution and that the overthrow of the Papadopoulos Marcosini's government was supported by the army, navy, and air force. At the same time, they announced that the new coup was a continuation of the revolution of 1967 and accused Papadopoulos with straying from the ideals of the 1967 revolution, and pushing the country towards parliamentary rule too quickly. Previous to seizing power, Ioannidis preferred to work in the background and he never held any formal office in the junta. Now he was the de facto leader of a puppet regime composed by members some of whom were rounded up by Greek military police ESA soldiers in roving jeeps to serve and others that were simply chosen by mistake. The Ioannidis method of forming a government dealt yet another blow to the rapidly diminishing credibility of the regime both at home and abroad. The new junta, despite its rather inauspicious origins, pursued an aggressive internal crackdown and an expansionist foreign policy. Topic. Cypriot coup d'état, Turkish invasion and fall of the junta Sponsored by Ioannidis, on 15 July 1974 a coup d'état on the island of Cyprus overthrew Archbishop Makarios III, the Cypriot president. Turkey replied to this intervention by invading Cyprus and occupying the northern part of the island, after heavy fighting with the Cypriot and Greek ELDYK forces Greek, Eldik Elenike Dynamé Kypro Greek force for Cyprus. There was a well-founded fear that an all-out war with Turkey was imminent. The Cyprus fiasco led to senior Greek military officers withdrawing their support for junta strongman Brigadier Dimitrios Ioannidis. Junta appointed President Faden Gazikis called a meeting of old guard politicians, including Panagiotis Kanalopoulos, Spiros Markazinis, Stefanos Stephanopoulos, Evangelos Averoff, and others. The agenda was to appoint a national unity government that would lead the country to elections. Although former Prime Minister Panagiotis Kanalopoulos was originally backed, on 23 July, Gazikis finally invited former Prime Minister Konstantin Karamanlis, who had resided in Paris since 1963, to assume the role. Karamanlis returned to Athens on a French presidency Learjet made available to him by President Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, a close personal friend, and was sworn in as Prime Minister under President Faden Gazikis. Karamanlis' new party, New Democracy, won the November 1974 general election, and he remained prime minister. Parliamentary democracy was thus restored, and the Greek legislative elections of 1974 were the first free elections held in a decade. A referendum held 8 December 1974 rejected re-establishment of the monarchy by a two-to-one margin, and Greece became a republic. While the physical collapse of the junta as a government was immediately caused by the Cyprus debacle, its ideological collapse was triggered by the 1973 Athens Polytechnic Uprising. The uprising at the Polytechnion was the event that discredited the military government most and acted as a key catalyst for its eventual demise by exposing the internal contradictions and stresses of the regime thus destroying the myth of the political cohesion of the junta and, therefore, irreparably damaging the political credibility of the Ethnosoterios e panastasis, and its message. Topic: <trials>, Trials of the Junta, 1975. In January 1975, the Junta members were arrested, and in early August of the same year, the government of Konstantinos Karamanlis brought charges of high treason and insurrection against Georgios Papadopoulos and 19 other co-conspirators of the military junta. The mass trial was staged at the Korytalos prison. 
The trial was described as Greece's Nuremberg. 1,000 soldiers armed with submachine guns provided security. The roads leading to the jail were patrolled by tanks. Papadopoulos, Patakis, Makarezos, and Ioannidis were sentenced to death for high treason. These sentences were later commuted to life imprisonment by the Karamanlis government. A plan to grant amnesty to the junta principals by the Konstantinos Mitsotakis government in 1990 was cancelled after protests from conservatives, socialists, and communists. Papadopoulos died in the hospital in 1999 after being transferred from Korydalos, while Ioannidis remained incarcerated until his death in 2010. This trial was followed by a second trial which centered on the events of the Athens Polytechnic Uprising and a third called, The Trial of the Torturers. <laughs> <laughs> Legacy and Greek public opinion The historical repercussions of the junta were profound and are still felt to this day in Greece. Internally the absence of civil rights and the oppression that followed created a sense of fear and persecution among many in the population creating trauma and division that persisted long after the fall of the junta. The Cyprus debacle created a tragedy that is still unfolding. While the Cyprus fiasco was due to the actions of Ioannidis, it was Papadopoulos who started the cycle of coups. Externally the absence of human rights in a country belonging to the Western Bloc during the Cold War was a continuous source of embarrassment for the free world considering Greece is seen as the inventor of democracy and this and other reasons made Greece an international pariah abroad and interrupted her process of integration with the European Union with incalculable opportunity costs. The 21st of April regime remains highly controversial to this day, with most Greeks holding very strong and polarized views in regards to it. According to a survey by Kappa Research published in the center-left newspaper Tavima in 2002, the majority of the electoral body consider the regime to have been bad or harmful for Greece while 20.7% consider it to have been good for Greece and 19.8% believe that it was neither good nor harmful. In April 2013, the Metron analysis poll found that 30% of Greeks yearned for the better days of the junta. The experiences in Greece were formative for several CIA officers, including Claire George and Gust Avrakotos. Avrakotos, for example, dealt with the aftermath when revolutionary organization the 17th of November murdered his superior, CIA station chief Richard Welch in 1975. Many of his junta-connected associates were also assassinated in this time period. Avrakotos himself had his cover blown by the media and his life became endangered. In 1999, U.S. President Bill Clinton apologized on the behalf of the U.S. Government for supporting the military junta in the name of Cold War tactics. There has been speculation that lingering social effects of the junta played a role in the rise of Golden Dawn, an extreme right wing party which gained 18 seats in parliament in two successive elections in 2012, in the midst of Greece's ongoing debt crisis. Golden Dawn's leader, Nikolaos Michaeloliakos, met the leaders of the junta while in prison and was inspired to lay the foundations for the party. Some have linked alleged support of Golden Dawn by Hellenic police officers to the party's statements sympathizing with the junta, which commentators note would appeal to policemen whose livelihoods are threatened by harsh austerity measures. Topic see also Timeline of modern Greek history History of modern Greece A man I mast Dio Topic Citations and notes Topic References Woodhouse, C. M. Modern Greece A Short History. London, Faber and Faber. ISBN 978-0-571-19794-1. Woodhouse, C. M. The Rise and Fall of the Greek Colonels. London. Nafpliotis, Alexandros Britain and the Greek Colonels, Accommodating the Junta in the Cold War. London, I.B. Tories. ISBN 978-1848859524. External links Matt Barrett. The Rise of the Junta in Greece. Matt Barrett. November 17, Cyprus and the Fall of the Junta.